and we thank you for the blessings and provisions you have given to us. We thank you for the privilege to come together in the fellowship and to listen to your word. We thank you for your Holy Spirit who does guide us and teaches us truth. Give us the ears to hear, eyes to see, and please keep our hearts tender before you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Well, the text that I would like to talk to you tonight is found in Luke chapter 7. Luke chapter 7, and it begins in verse 36 of Luke chapter 7. Let us now hear the word of the Lord. And one of the Pharisees desired him, that he would eat with him. And he went into the Pharisee's house and sat down to meet. And behold, a woman in the city, which was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus said at meet to the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of ointment, and stood at his feet behind him, weeping. And began to wash his feet with her tears, and did wipe them with the hairs of her head, and kissed his feet, and anointed it with the ointment. Now, when the Pharisee, which had bidden him, saw this, he spake with it himself, saying, This man, if he were a prophet, would have known who and what manner of woman this is that touched him, for she's a sinner. And Jesus said unto him, Simon, I have somewhat to say unto you. And he said, Master, say on. And he said, there was a certain creditor which had two debtors, and the one owed him 500 pence, and the other 50. And when they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgot he gave them both. Tell me, therefore, which one will love him most? And he said, I suppose that he, uh, to whom he forgave most. And Jesus said, thou hast rightly judged. And he turned to the woman and said to Simon, Seest thou this woman? I entered into thine house, and thou gavest me no water for my feet. But she hath washed my feet with her tears, <coughs> and did wipe them with the hairs of her head. Thou gavest me no kiss, but this woman, since the time I came in, has not ceased to kiss my feet. My head with oil thou didst not anoint, but this woman hath anointed my feet with the ointment. Wherefore, I say unto thee, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she had loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. And he turned to the woman and said unto her, Thy sins are forgiven thee. And they that said to me with said to myself, Who is this that forgiveth sins also? And he said to the woman, Thy faith hath saved thee. Go in peace. So as may God have a blessing to the reading of the word. For you have a paper in front of you, for the, for the Luke and the reference, I have, a, I have a title up there. Which one are you? Is on the title. Which one are you? I'm going to ask you, I'm going to ask you a rhetorical question, and I'm going to ask you to role play, take on a play. I'm going to ask you, you have to be honest with yourself. You've got to tell yourself which one of these players are you. I can't presuppose who you are, or what your heart's all about, but you have to decide on your own. There are three players. And the three players are, first of all, the Pharisee that desired Jesus to come into this meeting and have a meal with him. Or there's this innocent bystander within the meal or the party that says, well, this woman's got her audacity to come in here. What she thinks she's doing? Or this woman who is not subject to peer pressure and doesn't care what public thinks because she heard the words of Jesus somewhere, in the mountaintop, in the marketplace, and she's been blanketed with the words of freedom and mercy, and she wants to thank him. So let's go back and look at the Pharisee for a moment. I believe the Pharisee did not invite Jesus there to lift him up in front of his peers, but rather to prove him wrong in front of his peers. If I were to come to your house uh, for a meal, and, and you had all the settings on the table, you had the, the, pot, the pot roast and the mashed potatoes and the apple, all the trimmings, the pen salad, everything, everything there. And at every chair, you had a plate and silverware and a glass. 
But over at the end of this big, big, long table over here, you have this one elevated bar stool, and there's no plate, no glass, no silverware, and that's where you want me to sit. I'm going to feel a bit alienated here. Now, the innocent bystander, he, he's saying this woman, she has her audacity. The Bible says she was a sinner. We're all sinners, but for the sake of the dynamic of the story, culture says she was a woman of the evening. She was a harlot. So working off of that premise, a bystander saying, what's that woman doing in there? She's a harlot. She's not invited. So are you the Pharisee? Do you have to ask your own side, are you the Pharisee who is a, maybe has questions about this Jesus and who he is? And maybe you want to kind of discount who he is? Or are you an innocent bystander that is moved more by peer pressure than your own identity, as it were? Or are you this woman who is not moved by anything but having Jesus for thank you for what he's done for her? So we have now on your outline there you have I asked her, who are you? Now I've got this one word up there, the word on your paper, the word reasoning. Reasoning. I want you to think about this for a minute. The first blank, if you want to see, yeah, I'm not a good speller, but the first blank on the reasoning is the word analyze. Analyze. Let's say you take this scripture, you open up your Bible and you read the scripture, and maybe you come to the point where oh, uh, King David he was a young lad, and he was on fire for Jesus when he was young lad, he was on fire for God. In fact, if you go back to David for a moment, he was a young boy, and he was out there. Saul, it says in 1 Samuel chapter 10, Saul was actually a head and shoulders above everyone. He was a big man, King Saul. But because of his estranged relation with, relationship with God, he was afraid to fight Goliath. Little David was a little 13-year-old boy, couldn't, couldn't even wear the armor because he was so small. But because he had a, an innocent relationship with God, Goliath saw something too big to hit. David saw something too big to miss. <laughs> a matter of perception. So analyze, if you pick this Bible up, and maybe you, you wouldn't want to associate with, with uh, Abraham because he was going down to Egypt and he lied because he was afraid for his life. And he told sister, and so he told Sarah, tell me my sister. Well, that's a half truth. Same daddy, different mom. So there, there, there was a half truth. The half truth is still a lie. So or, or are you uh, David when he had actually sent Uriah to the front lines to be killed? Or are we? Uh, do we have? We can identify with different characters. So we we pick this up and we begin with, we begin to analyze the story, and we reason ourselves off the base. We analyze the next line. We we dissect. We analyze it, and then we dissect it. That's the next blank. We dissect the story. <clears throat> so we analyze it, we dissect it, and then initially the third line is we alienate ourselves from the scriptures. We dissect, we analyze, we dissect, and we alienate. Hence the story never touches our life. We want to make the shoe fit. If you maybe have to stuff some cotton in your shoes, maybe make the shoe fit your principles. Well, that's the first one. So I'm asking who you are. Now that we go down to the next word, and now we've got the word imagination. Imagination. Now, I want you, if you read the story, I don't know, no, you ever used, have you ever used the phrase, you don't have to answer if you use the phrase, well, I would never. I would never do that. Well, it's a good thing we ought not to say that the older we get, because it never happens all the time, we just never would. Well, so we, I would never act the way David did, or act the way Abraham did, or the way Isaac did. So we, we have to put our, imagine, the next word is imagination. Put yourself in the story. Imagine who you are, the three characters I asked you about. The first word on imagination is let the scriptures challenge you. Read it and ask who you are, let it challenge you. The second blank is, let it, if you let it challenge you, it will convict you. That's the second line. And the third one, it will initially end up changing you. Let it challenge you, let it convict you, and let it change you. 
I, I, because I told you, that in my understanding, all of these people, especially the listing in Hebrews 11, where the, the supposed uh, hero listing, all the people in the Bible, I can associate with them in some capacity. I can associate with Abraham. I don't know if you know the story about Abraham. When God called him out of the land of Ur and the Chaldees to go into a place, he had no idea where he was going. Abraham, and I'm not to get too cynical, I'm trying to identify modern, modern phrases, he had indoor plumbing. He had a computer. He had a car. He had, so he had everything. He was a wealthy man. He had everything known to his population at that time. And God's going to take him to out in the wilderness, and he never owns another piece of property and, and tell, other than when he bought the land that where he buried Sarah. That's all. He never. He lived. In, he moved around in tents with his children. Never owned it. He went, but he was a wealthy, wealthy man when it came to the end. But he had to trust God. He had all those things to let that go. He let us challenge him, convict him, and change him to follow the one who's called him. We can't be moved by the circumstances. We have to be moved by the God we serve. And so this, which one of these people are you in this story? See, in the character. So now we have, we have three, we have, uh, we have three violations of this woman. Well, I got that moves pretty fast, uh, Miss Renee. You got wow, it clicks pretty fast. <laughs> it's not, my fingers are too fat or something. I don't know. We got we got three violations. This woman here's the first violation. The woman came in there and she was unattended. Well, I'm gonna. Uh, well, first of all, before this, I got, let's identify the, the cultural uh, on your list. The cultural niceties first on your list in the paper. There. Cultural niceties. Three things I told you that that Pharisee was not, and I'm not trying to lift up Jesus, but, but separate him and, and, and speak against him and, and show you what's wrong. <coughs> There's three cultural niceties he did not do other than alienate him. One of them was washing the feet, was just to give, take the dirt off and walk in the, in the sandals in the dirt. Washing the feet, that was the first one. The second one was a holy kiss was like an American handshake. That was just a cultural nicety. And the third one was the anointing of oil for a fragrance purposes, as it were. That was a cultural nicety. He didn't do either one of those three. And then Jesus repeats this woman, did all of them in an intimate way to him. She wept on his feet and dried with her head. She kissed his feet and she anointed the feet as a servant, as it were. So she comes, here's a, here's a violation, the three violations. She came in there, culture, history, in that time frame, she was unattended by a man. She wasn't allowed to come because of her reputation. And for a woman to let their hair down in public was grounds for divorce. So she didn't care. He didn't want to do the niceties, and she didn't care about the violation because she had one purpose and one purpose. It's not fair to expect you or me or this woman to always be on the mountaintop. She was in the mountaintop with that present tense. That's not fair to have to remain there because I don't know about you, but as much as I don't like them, the valleys are the best teachers. If I always keep my eyes on the one that called me and the one I serve, the valleys are my best teachers. Anybody can get up on the mountaintop we can, we can, uh, and, and be glad about this and glad about that, but to, uh, so, uh, you have to ask yourself, don't ask you this question, ask yourself, sometimes we put Jesus in a shoebox in a closet on a shelf and we pull him out when it's convenient. He's a God that will be served and revered and honored. He's not put on a shelf in a shoebox. So in verse, verse in the, in the, here we have verse 41, I read that, it says that he, Jesus tells this Pharisee a story. And there's a creditor that has two debtors, and one owes 500 pence and one owes 50. And they, neither one of them have any way to pay this back. It's just what it is. It's a, and I'll, I'll, I'll repeat this and get back to this later, but what it is, it, 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 let's just say uh, you, sir, owe somebody a thousand dollars, and let's say Brother Will owe somebody a hundred thousand dollars. What? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just follow the story. We're just playing with you. <laughs> the, but the point is, if you have no resources to pay it back, it's nothing but a figure on a piece of paper. It doesn't mean anything. In essence, you and I 
cannot pay Jesus back for what he did. Romans 3.25 says he was the propitiation for our sins. That's an archaic King James word for full, satisfied payment in the eyes of God. And you and I are debtors, whether you like it or not, because of our great, 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 and I don't know how many grace I'll have to get that back to Adam, or our great grand grand that Adam, because of what he did in the garden and what happened, the broken relationship happened, and we're all in penalty of putting Christ on that cross. We have to deal with that. We have to admit that. We have to understand that. Because we have an exemption. It's Jesus and his shed blood. He took us out of that. We don't have to live there. We can come out of that. But we still have to understand that there was a debt, there was a price that was paid that unimaginable. I, the, the little bit I've done in history to research the, uh, the crucifixion, that the cat of nine tails was beyond barbaric. If you've ever seen what it is or know what it is, it's a piece of wood about so long and leather wrapped all the way to the handle and about nine leather straps coming off the end of that handle with pieces of glass and rock and metal. And those Roman soldier boys, they weren't choir boys, they were meat and potato boys. When they came down with a whack and that, that night, it got into his, the sinew and the muscles can pull things off. Isaiah 53 said he couldn't even be recognized as a man. His visage, he was torn up, he was brutally beat. And I'm of the opinion that he knew all those things were going to happen, the Old Testament prophecy, prophecy spoke of. And he still did it for you and I. He still went through that. In my understanding, the, 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 uh, the, the pain that he really suffered in the Garden of Eden, uh, the Garden of Gethsemane before he was going to go to the cross, and when he uh, sweat the blood drops and, and shed the tears and, and wept to his father, if it's possible, take this cup from him, but not my will, but thine be done. I think the agony that he really suffered, he knew about the cat of nine tails. He knew about the cord, the, throng, the, the crown of thorns. He knew about the whippings and the brutality and the cross. I think the terrible part was for the first time in, in eternity, for three hours, he would be separated from his father. That was, I had too much to handle. So this, this woman, she's in there. And she's mingling with the people, but she's, you know, if you get there, I need to go back and give you the picture of how the woman was weeping on Jesus' feet. If I understand right, culturally in those days, if a person would come to someone's house and there was a meal going on, and there was a visitor, people, could, people that were not invited could still come into the house and listen to what was being going on. But see, they had to go to the back wall. And when they, they would have people and they would eat, they would lounge on their elbows and have their feet behind them and they'd have cushions in the shape of a U. And the head guest would be at the top of that U. Hence, Jesus' feet were back there. Hence, the woman could stand and listen on the back wall and the tears would hit his feet. That's the position of what was going on there. And so she's, she's there doing this and I'm thinking about all the, all the thoughts that are going on within the, the game players in this store. The Pharisee, he's just not, this isn't going well for him because now this woman's come and distracted everything. And the, 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 the people in the party are being distracted by her. Now, on, on, the, on the back of your side of your paper there, it said, it said she, she, I wrote down here, the woman wasn't forgiven because she loved not another blanks. No, she wasn't forgiven because she loved much. But rather, she loved much because she understood her forgiveness. Does that make any sense? I'll go back and repeat that. She wasn't forgiven because she loved much. She loved much because she understood her forgiveness. That's where the Pharisee was saying that Jesus gave the comparison. 50 pence or 500 pence? $50 or $500? Which one are you, you have to ask yourself? Well, if the Pharisee was saying to himself, well, I'm only 50, it's the woman that's 500. Because of her lifestyle, because of her reputation, then he's just judged himself by coming to that conclusion. And he said the woman was forgiven much because she understood her forgiveness. And Jesus says, to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. I don't know about you, we all, have, we all have skeletons in our closet. We all have stories to tell. 
We all have uh, things that, get, that have happened in our life. And it's not necessarily, I, I don't want to get into, when I was a young Christian, there used to be a thing uh, back in the 70s uh, called uh, the testimony time. Maybe you're familiar with that, maybe you're not. But that was a big thing in church, that had testimony time. Come up and give your testimony. Well, it was okay <coughs> to lift up Jesus, but pretty soon it became a competition of graphics. My dog's bigger than your dog. And who's going to outdo the other guy? Really? Well, it's not about the stories and the skeletons in your closet. It's about how you came out on the other end. It's about who is God and who is not. A story is a good thing to tell to encourage someone, certainly. I'm not taking that out of the equation. But we can call it, I can sit back and think, if I allowed it to happen, I can think about all the negative things I've done in my life. And as far as I know, the adversary, he has a, he has a VCR, an old VCR. And he has a remote button. And the only remote button he has is to push on the negative stuff I've done. You understand what I'm saying? I need to get the remote out of his hand. Because there's a, there's a passage in the epistle of 1 uh, John chapter 2. He says, my old children, these things write I unto you that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Now, I'm not a language expert, but the word advocate is defined court-appointed lawyer. So if that's what it means, that means I need a court-appointed lawyer. I need Jesus to stand in the gap for me. Now, and the point is, I'm, I'm not a lawyer, but I do know this much. If you've gone to court, and you've been accused of a crime, and you've been acquitted, they can't get you a second time, because that's double jeopardy. So if you've gone to Jesus and asked him to forgive you and you repented and the adversary tries to put the rewind button on the garbage you've done, tell him, wait a minute, double jeopardy, we're not going there. Case is closed. His blood was shed for me and the case is open. So the point is, is you know, we need to well, I understand if you've been forgiven much and you understand the price of what it took to give you your forgiveness, we need to come to an appreciation the fact that Jesus, Yeshua, the Messiah, the King, he's done that for me? Really? And he's done it for you? But I think we have an appreciation problem up here. We can't see, wait a minute, this, this Bible tells us of these stories. He tells us of what he's done. But will we let it challenge us and convict us and change us? Or will we just imagine ourselves off the page or reason ourselves off the pages? We don't want to read. Jesus said in John 10, 10, the thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. But I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. If you read this Bible, you pick this up and you pick these stories up and you imagine who you are and where you're at, let it change your heart. If you read this, if you, I'm speaking in general terms, if you read this Bible and you're reading it to load your spiritual arsenal so you can impress somebody or argue theology, or argue doctrine, then the thief is probably stole from you. But if you read this and want to know who the king is, King Jesus intimately, in a relationship, you'll have life and you'll have more abundant day. I want him to teach me. I want to know so that I can stand my ground and be strong in him, but I don't want to argue about things that are, uh, well, you know, just, you get my point, it's a matter of, do you understand what he's done for you? Do you understand, you wake up in the morning and say, Thank you, Lord, for another day. Whether I get to proclaim you to somebody, that's not the issue. I get another day to spend with my friend, my king. I get another day to read his word and to talk to him and to ask him for his direction and help. That's a blessing. And there's, we all, well, I spoke about this the last time I had a Sunday or Wednesday night class. I said, all of us would love to see miracles. Physical miracles, that would be love to see. That we'd love to do that. But I submit to you, if you know my Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you're looking at the biggest miracle you'll ever participate in. That's your saved life and eternity with him. Amen. Nothing in this physical present tense will ever outweigh that. Nothing. And that's a mindset that, that if we, we read this, and you ever, have you ever heard the, uh, I guess it's a, a psychology thing about the white dog and black dog. You ever heard that phrase, the white dog and black dog? And they tell you that the one that you feed the most for the proper nutrition will win. Well, we need to feed the white dog with this here, the spirit man. Get the white dog fed. Let the white dog be a warrior for the kingdom. So, 
We're on the line, we're on the, the review section here. I, it says that the, in, verse, in verse 50, before we get to the review section, Jesus said to that woman, thy faith hath saved thee, go in peace. And I'm going to give you a little play on the words when they go in peace in that verse 50. I believe that the church, and we understand the phrase, this building is not the church, that we're the church. You understand that? Well, in my understanding, the church is a hospital. And the church is comprised of two components, doctors and nurses. And they are available and they're ready to help those who come that are Ill, uh, Ill and sick. But you see, if we're the church and we haven't taken time in our own lives to drop our baggage at the foot of the cross, we probably won't be ready to take care of those who we send our way. Amen. It's a personal vendetta on your own self to take care and unload your baggage at the foot so you can have ears to hear, as it were, for those he sends your way. So, the little play of word, the play of words in peace, he said, those who sends, he said, go in peace, they come to you and I carrying baggage. Because they, they, they carry pieces. Their pieces, their life is still fragmented. They're, he says, go in peace, they're carrying pieces and they come to you and I. We're either be there for one another to help men. He's the one, he's the healer of healers. I'm not taking that away. But we have circumstances, we have situations, we have things that here they go, a friend you can share with. He say, go in peace, they come in pieces. All right, and on your on the re review section on the back of your page, it said the part there, servant's attitude. That woman, she had a servant's attitude because she bowed down, she washed his feet with her tears and wiped with the hairs of her head. She kissed his feet, but you know, she didn't anoint his head with oil. She anointed his feet. She was in a servant mode. She was serving the king. He's my friend, yes, and he's my God, but he, he's the one that needs to be served. He, didn't, he said, I didn't come to minister to you, I came to minister, he said, that to his own disciples. And I'm, I'm, I'm not ashamed by any means to be called a servant to the Most High God. I count that to be a privilege to be a servant of him, to be available, to be, have a ready heart. And I touched on this review, I said, if you have been forgiven a little bit, if you've been forgiven little, if you know in your mind that you have been forgiven little, that's probably where you're going to react. We live in an action-reaction world. We do, you can't fight. If somebody reacts, we react. That's just the way we, our human nature is. But I need to have this tailor my thoughts and tailor my reactions. And I need to have myself put together on the fact that I have been forgiven much and I'm thankful for much. What did Paul the Apostle say? He learned how to live with a lot and a little. He learned how to, to uh, he had a, quite an experience, certainly. I can only, this is my, my childlike visual. I'm thinking, wow, he was going that, down that road to Damascus and maybe he was riding, riding a white stallion going to get them Christians. But you know what, all of a sudden he got knocked off that stallion big time and didn't have a choice. God had put him in his place. Well, I want God to put him in my place. I don't have to hope I don't have to get knocked off a stallion riding down the road where he needs to give my attention and do whatever he has to do. And he said, if you feel you have been forgiven a little, we under, we have, maybe we haven't understood or considered the price of his death. I've already gone through that. I went through it. One time, I just the Easter time, and thinking about what he did in his death and his resurrection, and and that, and Luke 24, when he's up there in the room with his disciples and they're talking to him, and they're trying to, he's trying to encourage them. I still don't think they had an understanding what was going on until the day of Pentecost, when he actually opened their eyes with the scripture. That's just my thought. Now, the very last phrase, I'll ask you, you don't have to answer this, but, but, but don't, don't throw the tomatoes yet. Don't, just, just hang with me on this last question. Within the story, within the dynamics of this story, is Jesus the answer or the problem? He's my answer. <laughs> I mean, I'm not saying he's not the answer. I'm saying within the story, he's both. He's the answer. But within the story, this woman, if she was actually a heart, and she came, he changed her life. Now, there's a problem because she has to go out and get a different job the next day. Who's going to hire her? The Jews? Doubt it. 
You see, what I'm trying to say to you, if Jesus Christ, if you're standing up for him and being a warrior for the kingdom and acknowledging him, and if there's never been a problem in your life in society, maybe you need to check your walk. That may sound cruel. I don't know, but I'm not trying to be cruel. Because there are going to be times they're not going to like you. They're not going to want to hear about this. You can talk about God, and that's so generic that it could be my Harley I ride, or golf clubs in your trunk, or whatever. But you talk about the name of Jesus, and you put the fists up. Now the fight starts. Because it's the name of Jesus, and everything will bow to. So he is the answer, certainly, without question. But he can be a problem, not to me, but to the people out there. I can be put in situations where I have to, and I've always, uh, in my opinion, as I read this, I don't need to put my fists up for Jesus. He's a big boy. He can take care of himself. But I need to make sure I put on him on the right path with who I am. So he is both. Now, we're done way too early. I just talked 100 miles an hour. Anybody got any questions, Q&As, or thoughts, or anything like that, rebuttals? Oh, he's yes, that. Nobody was that. <laughs> How does that go again on verse 47? She wasn't forgiven because she... Okay, thank you for asking that. She wasn't, she wasn't forgiven because she loved much. She wasn't forgiven because she loved much. But rather, she loved much because she understood her forgiveness. Her eyes had been opened. She understood her forgiveness. She understood the price she paid. So did you get it that time? Yeah. Well, thank you for asking. Yeah, she understood. So she didn't uh, buy her forgiveness. What's that? She didn't buy her forgiveness. No, no, no. Th thank you for the, th thank you for, uh, for saying that, Patty, because that's, that's a good one, too. I, and I'll be all by myself on the spot here. I don't care how many scriptures you memorize. I don't care how many spiritual calisthenics you can do. God's not impressed and we didn't get it. It's not a merit system. It's not very, so she didn't earn it, she didn't buy it. He, she felt those words. I say, I, earlier I said that the Bible doesn't tell us where she heard his words, in the marketplace, where the Mount Topic, I don't know. But she heard them, and she was moved, because the, 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 the other scenarios were, were, were killing her and suffocating her, and there was no hope. But she heard hope in Jesus' words, and she wanted to thank him. That's why I say there are some times that you can't expect her to be on the mountaintop all the time. People come in to a worship service and some person might react this way, some person react that way. I don't want to squelch how they, so if that's going on in the heart, then bless the Lord, let them, that's what they're, they're worshiping him. I don't want to squelch that. So she had an understanding. Thank you for asking that. And thank you, sir, for asking the question. She understood her forgiveness. Yes. Anybody? No? Well? Yes. We take way too much for granted. We take way too much for granted. That's it. Yes, Will? I agree with you 100%. Right. We take for granted that we got to go up, we got to wake up this morning, we got to breathe air. We're, we're alive. You know, we have something to eat. We take for granted. You're exactly right. We go through the day and, uh, wow, I was blessed to make it through another day and I'm still here. I get to wake up, and, I'm, and you're right, we take this, uh, as I was saying earlier, uh, there needs to be an appreciation factor here. You're exactly right. Because I, you know, I, I do my best to, uh, we, we, none of us know what's going to happen tomorrow or the next week, and, that, and, that, and that's probably a good thing we don't know. We wouldn't want to know. But I do know this much, he is in control. He is my focus. He's the issue. Regardless of what the circumstances are, I know where the end result is. That's all that matters to me. I want to be sensitive. I want to help people. I want to be available. But I, I without question, cannot afford to take my eyes off the path and stay the course. Finish the race. Finish the race. Exactly. And I, and I hope to hear him say one day, well done, my faithful servant. Do you ever go to bed and sometimes I lather before I go to sleep and I talk to him and I weep about it? I do that and I talk to him and weep about it. And in fact, it's a quite a sedative. I go to sleep reciting scripture. And, and it's, it's quite a sedative, believe me. And, and asking him for the day. Here's a challenge.
challenge for people. Uh, these uh, young men I mentor, I ask them, uh, when you go to bed at night, why don't you take a piece of paper and a pencil? And I want you to jot down all the amount of time you worried about the world, and I want you to jot down the amount of time that you gave God to do, and at the next meeting, we're going to add it all up. And uh, you'd be surprised, you wouldn't be surprised to learn that many times they forgot the notebook. <laughs> and I want, I want to add, I want to add, you forgot the notebook, and that's a good one. I wasn't trying to tell you. I want to add to that story, though, because I want to, I want to present, the, I've presented this question before uh, from the pulpit. Say, I want to ask you, you have to answer your own self. It's rhetorical. Don't, don't give me the figures. I've asked people in a given 24 hour day, how many times have you thought about the kingdom and how you'll be? And it's in a given 24 hour day, how many times is all that? Let me tell you, I want to tell you another short story, please, and because I know we can, it won't take very long, it's another short one. If you're in the book of Luke, you, if you return to chapter 10, I'll tell you one more little story. Luke, I know, I know you're familiar with this story, but I'd like to give you an application. It's Luke chapter 10, and it begins in verse 25. Luke chapter 10 and verse 25. And a certain lawyer tempted him, saying, Master, you know, what shall I do to inherit, inherit eternal life? And he said unto him, Well, what is written in the law? How readest thou? And he answered and said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and all thy soul and all thy strength and all thy mind and thy neighbor as thyself. And Jesus said, That's a good answer. This doing thou shalt live. Uh, but he willing to justify himself, said unto Jesus, And who is my neighbor? And Jesus said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. And by chance there came a certain priest that way, and when he came and looked on him, he passed by on the other side. And likewise, a Levite, when he was at the place, came and looked on him and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and set him on his own beast, and took him to an inn and took care of him. And on the morrow, when he departed, he took out two pence and gave them to the host and said, Take care of him. And what sir thou spendest more when I come again, I will repay thee. Which now <coughs> of these three thinkest thou as neighbor to him that fell among the thieves? And he said, I suppose that he did show mercy on him. And Jesus said, Go and do thou likewise. So in the reading of that scripture. You've heard the story. It's interesting to me. But as Patty said, you are earnest of right now asking, now what do I have to do? to have eternal life. And Jesus, I love his response. Well, what do you, how do you read that? How do you interpret that? What do you think? What do you say, what do you, what do I say to you? And then he gives the Jewish common rabbinic response. To love the Lord thy God with all the heart, all his soul, all his strength, all the mind and neighbors I shall. Now I'm gonna take a little risk of being transparent with you for a moment and I'm gonna put myself on the spot. If I said to you that I, Michael Ginn, Love the Lord my God with all my heart 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 a day without flaw. I think I'd be lying to you. Because I'm human. I can make mistakes. I can have an attitude. That means I need a savior to stand in the gap for me. Now you're going to think worse of me because I just said that, I hope. Yeah, I'm done. I'm out of here. All right, fine. <laughs> I'm trying to be honest with you. We're not flawless. We need a Savior. We need Jesus standing in the gap for us. But this man, one that works, and I believe that he asked Jesus. He didn't ask Jesus, how do I love God with all, all these four things? He didn't. Ask, so maybe he thought he had that figured out. But he asked Jesus who his neighbor was. Interesting to me. He didn't want to know who his neighbor was so he could go out and love everyone. He wanted to know what the working parameters were so we didn't have to love somebody. You get my drift? He wanted, we, want a, we want a hoop to jump through, and God doesn't give any hoops. We want working parameters? No! He wants the whole of your heart, a broken and a contrite heart. And so Jesus tells him this story. 
He tells them about this free, this man that came from Jer Jerusalem to Jericho. There's a thing called the 18 mile stretch called the Bloody Road from Jerusalem to Jericho. And thieves and so on and so forth are there. Now, this man comes down, and Jesus said this man came down first. And I could be cynical, I don't want to be too cynical, but I could say to you, well, religion passed him up twice. The priest and Levi, I don't know, will say that. Anyway, the, the priest comes down, and maybe, just maybe, maybe the priest is in a seven day revival meeting. And he's coming home. And his pay is a bag of grain. And his family's hungry. And if he stops and touches the dead body, he's got to go back up to Jerusalem, get the whole ceremony, get clean again, and his family won't eat. So he's got an excuse. An excuse is like those. Everybody's got one. Different sizes, shapes. Yeah, excuse. That was his excuse. Now, the Levite comes by and he says, wait a minute, my boss was just here and he knows more than I do. Huh? Or maybe the guy's not really dead. He's got six buddies in the ditch. He's going to jump me. Another rationalizing excuse. But then the, the Samaritan comes along. And we all know how much the Jews hated Samaritans. Way back in the book of Kings, there was a king that came and conquered the land and took the Jews out and put their priests in the lion's cannon. Anyway, they hated them. They were athletes. <coughs> Maybe. And see, we all have experiences. And I, your experiences can be used in a positive way because they can allow you to talk some to someone that someone else can't talk to. It's not, I've, you know, I've been there, done there, but I don't want the t-shirt. I've got too many t-shirts. I'm being honest with you. But I can have these experiences to share with someone. My, my, my analogy to the end of the story is this. Perhaps the scenario is stopped because perhaps at some point in time he was the guy in the ditch. Stop to help the man. Not counting the cost, not wondering the scenario, not excusing us. He helped him because he'd been down there, he'd been broken, and someone helped him. It's the brokenness that we can realize, this, this, the forgiveness of our sins, the brokenness that we can realize that can make us a warrior for the kingdom and stand strong regardless of the circumstances. Amen. Well, I guess I am done. If you don't have any thoughts or whatever, because anybody, any prayer requests, if anybody want to have a prayer request. We didn't do that at the beginning. I guess I got things out of order. Yeah, yes? I have a couple of prayer requests. Yes. Uh, one for my wife that uh, she had a quick healing. It's going to be a long, slow process, but still, thank God that uh, she's doing well. Oh, and yeah. then my brother, he had a I have a rough time here right what happened now. to Donna? Uh, she had an outpatient surgery type. Yep. Uh, it's going to take a little while for the healing process to oh. take place there. I'm sorry. I didn't, we didn't and, know. and your brother? And then my brother, he uh, has had a bout with an MRI and a CT scan, and they finally decided that something about vertigo. And so that kind of sets him aside a little bit that really doesn't do him well. And then, uh, my son-in-law, Ray, he's doing well, but uh, for continued prayer for him, that uh, God would completely heal him, heal him. And what's your brother's name? Jeff. Jeff? Mm -hmm. uh, and then Ray, and then your, and your wife, Donna. Yes. yes. Well. Anyone else? We're praying for the pastor who's sick. Pastor Steve, yes. We pray for Pastor Steve, yes. <coughs> And her sweet little Ashley is not well. She's got, she does have shingles. The who, I'm sorry? And Ashley Gray, uh, Van Wart. She has what? She, she has shingles. shingles. Oh, yes. Yeah. <coughs> <coughs> the mom of those pretty little okay. the baby. Shingles, you said? Nasty. I've never had it. I'm thankful for it. I don't know about people. I know people who have nasty. Yeah. It's usually oh. old people, not young ones. Yeah. yeah. That's all changing, too. <laughs> <laughs> we don't want to play that on the clock. We don't want to do that. <laughs> People, I'm not trying to be cynical with them, but they ask me how old I am. Well, I'm just one day closer to Jesus. That's all I'm going to tell them. So. <clears throat> that's, that's my answer. Anyone else?
I guess we can we can uh, join the hand. Don't want to break protocol too much. We need to join the hand there and pray. We're on YouTube and Steve is watching, so we don't.